everyone. Welcome to the 427th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patron Ryan Kindle. I'm Oren Kaplan. And I'm Matt Enlow. Today, we've got Nina Meredith on the podcast. She's an awesome director. She does commercials. She does documentaries. We have a really great conversation, especially if you're interested in sports, documentary, or commercials. This is a great episode for you in particular. We go deep on her process. She has kind of a lot of surprising methodologies and a way in on shooting verite footage in particular that I found really inspiring and kind of like a novel approach that we haven't really talked about a ton on the show. And I'd be curious to see how you take those philosophies and graft them onto different styles of shooting she's awesome it is interesting because she has like this mix of docu style filmmaking but also like she's like very much a visual artist like the Mm -hmm. shots Mm -hmm. in her docu work are amazing and she also has done like she did a commercial with paris hilton she's done all these kind of different celebrities and kind of also non-celebrity like real people narrative scripted totally storyboarded commercials we inadvertently i feel like focused a lot on the more doc style stuff because her most recent spot is uh, about mental health and is this sweeping 90 second 11 different sports leagues star studded anthem brand piece is so awesome that we ended up i think just focusing a lot on that she has another side to her career that's also equally exciting that we could have just nerded out on as well where the moves are much more specific and stuff that we, we we touch on a little bit but like we live in the world of that that sports and that documentary sort of vibe for most of the conversation do you know she also does like car commercials what can't she do yeah um but yeah it's weird it's you know as our careers age it's like you try to pitch yourself as the perfect person for a job mm-hmm. but then also the longer we work like the wider the breadth of our reels are and i do think nina is just really good at capturing humanity <laughs> I, I don't know not sure. to, not to yeah. make it sound yeah. a, a human angle whether you're yeah. talking about an athlete or a model or a person or driving a car. bmw x5 yeah. you know um yeah no it's it's fun um and she's cool she lives in la so if that doesn't teach you something I don't know what will. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I'm just kidding. Tell our listeners that hate how much I talked about LA. I apologize. Uh, are you still getting that? Whether you live in Los Angeles or elsewhere in the world, if you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash just shoot it pod. Throw us a couple bucks. If you live in Los Angeles, you know, if you want to buy us a, a coffee, that could cost you anywhere from 4 to $19. If you would like to uh, pay for Oren's uh, latte or the equivalent, really, because we're giving it all to Noah, patreon.com slash just shoot a pod is the place where you can throw us a buck or two. I just recorded a Patreon exclusive conversation with a listener who had some very specific questions about WeFunder that we're not ready to release yet because I want to make sure that we're not accidentally breaking any laws before his 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 project goes live what's a law that you would be breaking well because you're trading securities it's Mm -hmm. when you file with the sec and this is one of the things that we talk about in this conversation when you file with the sec you have to show them all of the solicitations that you've made you send them every email you've sent about soliciting for money basically like they have to review all of that stuff and so there's specific rules about promotion especially before the project goes live and so i just didn't want to accidentally get them in trouble they're going live relatively soon so that'll be something that patrons can have access to but my point is we're recording patreon only additional content for people we'll post about it on patreon they'll get an update Let's not waste any more of your time. Let's talk to Nina Meredith. Here we go. Okay, we're here with Nina Meredith. Nina, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks guys for having me. Well, yeah, thanks for coming on. We're excited to talk. I mentioned to you the EP I used to work with, like is now an EP at the company or with Radical Media. So I've been kind of like all over the Radical site and just kind of like checking out what it is and who's there and obviously saw your stuff which is awesome and like i guess when i look at your work i mean obviously you you've been directing for a while right how long have you been directing commercials 
Oh man. Well, that's actually an interesting story if, if we want to get into the, the backstory, but, um, I think I've been directing commercials maybe around eight, eight, nine years. Okay, cool. It's a really interesting backstory. Fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <too. laughs> well, well uh, tell us. Yeah. Yeah. How did you, how did you find yourself in commercials? What's, what's the story there? Um, well, the story, I mean, how I found myself into commercials was, um, you know, I, I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a photographer. Then I became an agency producer turned branded content director, Mm -hmm. and then found my way gravitating towards how can I do more commercial work, um, less long form branded content work. And, um, I got an incredible opportunity to direct a Nike commercial with Michael B. Jordan. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think I've ever been so terrified in my entire life. I was shaking. I was puking. I was like, Oh my God, what am I going to do? How am I going to direct this incredible, you know, performer? And at the time you, you thought it was Michael Jordan. Well, actually my EP did call me. He said, it's either Michael Jordan or Michael B. Jordan. And I was like, okay. Well, either way, it's for Nike. So yeah, either way, I'm happy to do it. Um, yeah. Anyway, long story short, I, uh, when we got on set, he was incredible. He gave me a big hug, um, calmed my nerves. And was he uh, part of, did he have to like approve you? Like, I don't know if a lot of our listeners know, but a lot of yeah. times when you work with celebrities in like the commercial space, the celebrity has to like give the okay to the director. Yeah, that was, I really, I, I remember knocking on his trailer. They were like, he's ready to meet you. Um, his shirt was off. He <laughs> gave me a very beautiful bear hug and said, I'm such a fan of yours. And I, I, had I, I usually do that by the way. For like yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just yeah. had incredible imposter syndrome. And I was, I was like, he must be confusing me with someone <laughs> like I, there's just no way. Um, and then when we got to set, um, we started, it was kind of a doc style hybrid commercial and, I remember, you know, saying like, okay, before we get into it, let's just meditate. Let's just, because I was so nervous. I needed to meditate mm-hmm. and we were rolling camera. Wait, you said this just to Michael B. Jordan or to like the whole crew, like on the megaphone? Yeah, <laughs> just to Michael B. Jordan. Um, I have done a crew meditation before. That's a, a different story. But um, I said, let's just roll camera. You know, he and I had this beautiful moment where we meditated together and I didn't know what I was doing. I was just kind of making it up as I, as I went and he, wait, so wait, so you're just yeah, like, yeah, too many close questions. your yeah. eyes. Yes. Think yeah. of a, a tropical uh, <laughs> sure. cafe somewhere in Birmingham, but, but also still with like a crew standing around waiting for you. Right. Well, I asked, yeah, I asked the crew just to step outside and give us like cool. a, a minute. It was just me at DP audio and, um, it was a bit of a visualization exercise. I was an athlete. He's an athlete. I kind of was going through what it looked like to be a, in the ring in a boxing ring. Mm-hmm. And he just, Oh my gosh, he was amazing. He talked for like one or two minutes. His eyes were closed. Then he opened his eyes and everyone, you know, had chills who was listening. And, um, I was like, you know what, that's, that's going to become the, the, backbone of the commercial and that became the audio and mm-hmm. ever since then oh oh cool that's incredible wait but what so that was not part of the concept no no it wasn't um and he asked like oh are you you know have you been a therapist in a past life like that was so <laughs> healing and so um I, t- I take this method with me sometimes when working with all-star celebrity athletes or actors i think it's a really mm-hmm. nice way to to just, you know, open, open the set, open a moment, um, open a scene and really build trust in such a small mm-hmm. amount of time you have with these people, you know, Wait, um, and everyone's like, cool. Like, yeah, let's close our eyes and let's talk. Yeah. And I love doing it with these like hyper masculine guys, you know, mm-hmm. like I really like bringing out this, this like inner femininity or, or sensitivity. Mm-hmm. I think it's, I don't know. It's really human and it's a beautiful way to connect with someone. Yeah. It's, it's really fascinating to me because it it almost sounds like method, 
mm-hmm. like method acting, you know, but, but, um, but like in a docu space, kind of. in a docu space and just like a little kickstart of it. Do you know what I mean? Like they do a lot of like sense memory and the, right. it's quite meditative as well. And the, all, that's all that prep and the breath work and all of that stuff. And so it sounds like this is just like a very concentrated dose of that same ideology, but, but with mixed in with essentially guided meditation as well. That's pretty wild. It's pretty radical. Yeah. Thank you. Radical. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, pun intended. I think, no, pun no. Thank you. <laughs> when you're working with these people, you usually get less than an hour. Sometimes mm-hmm. you only get 30, 20, 30 minutes. So I just am always, you know, now very um, aware and thinking, okay, what's the best strategy for this person? Mm-hmm. And it really is a form of, I think, psychology and, and, human interest, reading people, trying to understand what their intentions are, why they're there. And, and then we become uh, like a a bouncing board for them, a bit of a mirror. So I'm just there to help whoever it is deliver. So for that one, which is, this is your first commercial, this Michael B. Jordan thing. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. You're starting in the dumps. Um, (laughs) How do you, what, what's the concept? Like, are you like going to shoot? You're like, Hey, we're going to meet at a boxing gym. We're going to shoot some boxing B-roll and kind of just figure out like who you are and what your method is. Yeah, of course I have, you know, go in with a shot list and storyboards and what I think the voiceover can be. Um, and I meet with the cinematographer, the product. It was also the first time I ever worked with a production designer. You know, I walked into this Jim and I was like, oh, it'd be really cool if there were mirrors on the wall. And the production designer, I don't even think I knew what a production designer did, was like, you want mirrors? No problem. And I was like, whoa, I can ask for mirrors. Um, So I don't know. Sorry, I forgot the question, but it was just a really uh, amazing launch pad into commercial directing. I had been directing a few years, Mm -hmm. uh, doing a lot of in the doc space, but this was the most like traditional commercial I had been exposed to. Yeah. I mean, yeah, certainly like on the logistics side or just on the careerist side, uh, you you know, I'm curious how this opportunity arose, but it sounds like you, you know, you're, you're underplaying your experience up to that point. You were a doc filmmaker. You're a doc filmmaker. And And you knew how agencies worked. Yeah. 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 I mean, it was a triple bit, like jobs didn't just fall out of the sky for Michael Jordan or Michael B. Jordan. (laughs) Um, But it, it was an incredible opportunity and it was awesome that Nike even took a chance on, on me. Do you have any insight into why they decided to take a chance on you? Like what, what was the, that X factor? Again, I think I, they must have confused me with someone famous. <laughs> I no, don't that know. That can't be, though. That can't be. No, I don't know. <laughs> Mina Simone. Um, I had worked with a lot of athletes before. Yeah, sure. Um, there you go. Okay. And yeah. I had I had a bit of a reel, and I think they liked what they saw, and they liked the humanity seen mm-hmm. in a lot of my work. And, um, yeah, gave me gave me the shot, which was really great. Cool. Yeah. So you mentioned that you were an athlete. Were you like a college pro what what was the sport um college uh athlete i did track and field okay and you and i mean obviously one of the things that we see in your work a lot is athletes and sports Mm -hmm. and kind of like a lot of vo driven just Mm -hmm. things about like like working hard and pushing yourself and just kind of like excelling as like a human being seems like kind of a theme throughout your, your work, especially like your, your doc work. Yeah, that's absolutely accurate. I think what draws me to athletes in particular is they are natural born performers, but you know, I think we see them behind a screen you know, most of the time watching our favorite sports event and we put them on this pedestal and we think, oh, they're this superhero. And I'm really interested in kind of opening the curtain and trying to get them, you know, trying to understand them as people and approach them as such rather than, oh my God, you're Michael B. Jordan or oh my God, you're... Asia Wilson or whoever it may be. Um, Mm -hmm. 
you know, I try never to really like fangirl out over anyone or I just think a lot of people want a platform to speak and share their story. And if I can just do a small part in that and, and get a superstar athlete to open up and see this like side of them we don't often see as viewers, it's a really beautiful, like inspiring thing. Yeah. Yeah. And also you're, you're making me realize like, you know, most athletic advertising, right? Like, you, you know, a Nike or any sort of sports affiliated brands. That's really kind of the essence of all of that great advertising. Like every once in a while, it's really, really game focused. But for the most part, it's a human interest story about your favorite athlete. And like, you know, the implication is like, if you drink Powerade, you can be as, uh, you know, uh, grounded and insightful and as accomplished as your favorite athlete all at once. Right. So like it is that perfect combination of your interests aligning with and artfulness aligning with exactly what, uh, you know, sports brands love to do best. You know what I mean? That's pretty great. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they're people are the greatest marketing tool and sure. that's why we see all these celebrities or influencers or whoever getting the endorsements because mm -hmm. we want to follow in their footsteps. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's like, you know, I feel like a lot of athletes, especially like the, the top athletes are like these stories of perseverance. So, you know, just looking through your site, like Google pixel, you know, like you can see Google using a story of perseverance and working hard mm -hmm. and kind of, doing going beyond the limits that people thought you know that it placed on you as something that like a tech company for instance wouldn't would be interested in telling a story like that right, um, right i'm curious like just looking at your work like obviously you have the uh, like a lot of you know under armor with steph curry mm -hmm. google pixel with the women's world cup and we'll talk about kind of the um this big sports campaign you, you did in a few minutes but you also did like a Super Bowl spot for Robin Hood and a Grey Goose spot with Paris Hilton. And like your mm -hmm. Sephora spot feels very like boarded and specific and like dynamic, like mm -hmm. very specific mm -hmm. transitions and camera movements and things like how do you like hearing you talk about just like your meditation with Michael B. Jordan makes me like as a as like an agency producer, as a client think like, ooh, I want to hire Nina so she can like go tap into this like inner core of these um, people that are on camera. But then you look at a Sephora spot or the even, you know, the Robin Hood spot or something. And you're like, well, that's this is less about like tapping into some truth in a human and more about you as like a director. Right. Like the or like as, as someone that knows how to use the camera to tell a story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. How, how did you transition from like the docu like mm -hmm. opening up people into more of like this visual art form. So, I mean, I know you, it seems like you still do both of those things. Yeah. Lot. I think that's the beauty of what we do as directors, commercial directors, like you get to play in so many sandboxes or I, I get to, or would like to, I still would want to do more with that. The Paris Hilton thing was my foray into comedy and please don't critique that one. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I want to be a bit of a chameleon, a bit of a director who, who can be super diverse and, um, flex different muscles. Um, I think where the thread may, may lie is in my casting, even mm -hmm. in Robin Hood and Sephora, it was really important for Sephora. For example, the ad agency really wanted, um, inclusive casting. And that's a phrase we hear a lot in commercials, but it's like, okay, well, what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. Um, and so a lot of these campaigns are hybrid actors and real people, because I feel like it's really important to s continue in my work to give real people a chance. And, um, oftentimes in these commercials, the actors will come up to me and say, this was my very first commercial. And, we had no idea. And I think that's such mm -hmm. a, an awesome thing and a testament to, to everyone involved that they hired this person. Um, so my approach doesn't change, like whether it's an actor, a real person or an athlete, it's um, the fun for me lies in what can we do with the camera? What can we mm -hmm. do with a, a techno crane 
how can I work with a visual effects team to make it a perceived one or when it's definitely mm-hmm. not. Um, I don't know. I think what we do is so magical and we get to create illusion. And that for me is a really exciting thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you, you talked about, oh, sorry, man. Go ahead. I wonder who I have a hunch will end up. Well, I'll say the question, then maybe we can decide whether we go down this thread or, or not. Um, but so I, I feel like I'm, I'm picking up on a really like clear vibe in terms of how you work with actors and the type of actors that you're you're um, you're you like to work with and, and just kind of an overall approach that feels like relatively clear already. And I'm curious uh, because your camera work is equally uh, exciting and technical. And and to Oren's earlier point, you get to jump back and forth between, you know, hyper specific technocrane moves and then something more lyrical like a doc. Do you feel like there's any sort of similarity between your approach to the way you work with performers and the way you work with a camera team? Are the, you know, are you doing some version of meditating with them or how do you collaborate with a camera team and, and to match that aesthetic if, if so? Well, that's a really interesting question. I love working with new teams, new DPs. I, I have my go-tos, especially within like the doc space, but mm-hmm. there's so many incredible commercial DPs, hundreds or if not thousands. And when you get a job, you get sent a lot of reels. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, the talent is just as important as what what they're going to bring to the table and who they are as a person. I, I really pride myself on working with good people. I would take a really good person um, who's slightly maybe less skilled or talented than mm-hmm. an asshole cinematographer. Um, mm-hmm. Cause I've worked with those too. And you feel really, sh- I don't know if I'm allowed to curse terrible at the end of the day. You are. So, um, So, you know, my initial calls with a cinematographer is here's my idea, here are my references, but let's hear yours. And I really, really invite collaboration and I like to bring people in really early, even editors and colorists into the process. Yeah, I love that. Colorists too. That's great. I love that. How do you like on a job where you don't have posts, for instance, do you or are there jobs like that or do you kind of insist on using your editor, like right when you're bidding? I always am going to suggest a a team that I think would just kill it. Um, Am I listened to all the time? No, but Mm -hmm. a lot of the times they, they do hire the post team or people that I suggest. So I, I do feel very lucky about that. You know, oftentimes in the edit, it'll go a bit, sideways and then you as a director know okay maybe i'll take a back seat and do a director's cut um but then there's some beautiful times where they let you drive it the whole way through and you want to have your people on your side for that so um definitely with post i have my go-to's um my you know list of people they're often booked and then i i'll definitely be open to working with new people but um yeah, I, I think there's also something in loyalty in our industry. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I said I like to usually work with new DPs, but I also love working with some of my oldest friends that did that Nike job back in the day. Um, I think it's really cool to evolve alongside other mm-hmm. creators and collaborators. But I do keep like a in my notes, my you know Apple Note patent or notes app or whatever I have like a list of like I'll be on Instagram I'll see something I'll be like oh that's a cool cool color like who's the colorist cool production design I have like a list of people that I'm just like fans of and a lot of them I don't even like like right now I'm working with this like amazing colorist Greg at Royal Muster and I don't even know he was just on my list I don't even know how he got on my list I must have seen something on Instagram or something but um Um, Greg actually colored the ad council campaign Oh, awesome. 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 Oh, cool. Yeah. He's, um, he's really good. Uh, I, I've been able to like, you know, suggest people very strongly, but it's always 
I have to have a very specific reason. Like this editor is so good at this type of thing. They're they're perfect for an anthem and here are the six anthems that they've done. Or more often like, hey, they do a ton of like rough VFX mm-hmm. to like tweak a performance in ways that that you know will help us retime things or things like that. Like they have to have like some specific trick up their sleeve in order for me to really get them sold through. Otherwise I tend to get bulldozed. I feel like speaking of the colorist that I met somehow randomly, um, he colored your ad council campaign, which I wanted to quiz you real quick, put you on the spot. According to campaign Asia.com, there are 11 pro sports leagues that teamed up for this mental health PSA. Can you name the 11 in under 30 seconds? Oh my gosh. Okay. Let's go. Wait, are we starting the clock? Uh, yeah. N W S L M L S P C R A U S T A W N B A N B A um, W W E N F L N H L uh, MLB. Oh my God. Who is the last one? I'm such an asshole. Did you say NBA already? She NBA. No, I said NBA. NBA. With WNBA. NBA. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and we went, we did soccer. Is there like a ping pong league of some sort? Oh my gosh. Who am I forgetting? Oh, NASCAR. NASCAR. Which is like one of the most popular sports in America. Yes. Chase Elliott. Oh, wow. it was, that was a very early I, shoot. It feels like so long ago. I am very impressed. I, the, I would yeah. have gotten five and then like, oh, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> For the record, you got yeah. 10 under 30 seconds. So okay. Not, okay. Not when I, thank you. Um, and also NASCAR is like harder. Like it's different than all of the other ones. And it's like the like WWE is sort of that too. It's like it's kind of in a category unto itself. Whereas like. I would group like, okay, like WNBA and NBA, of course, you'd lump those together. You know what I mean? Anyway, for listeners who haven't had the good fortune of seeing the spot yet. It's one of those kind of, you know, big epic montage pieces where it's just like there's a cut every second or half a second. And it's a different sport and a different crowd. And, a di- you know, there's a big through line to it. But like the amount of footage that you must have gone through is just, just incredible. It's just massive. And so I guess having never done a spot like that, like, you know, most of the time two guys are deciding to order a pizza on a couch, you know, (laughs) Um, that's like my bread and butter. Uh, This is a naive question, but like how much of that is original footage that you're shooting and how much of that is archival or licensed in some way? Like, like how much, how much is, it, do you find and how much do you create generate yourself basically this was definitely a hybrid of archival reenactments with the kids and um b-roll that i shot with the athletes which i was in person for half of remote for the other half working with almost 10 different cruise um when you say b-roll would would that count going to like a tennis match and shooting it or would you call that something else yeah did you do any docu filming of an actual of actual events no all of the event footage was um donated by that league so a lot of the leagues would send um which was incredible and ad council and walton isaacson was able to get hours and hours of footage donated so then i would go through and make my markers and Mm -hmm. some leagues had incredible footage that was very hard to edit down other leagues gave us a 30 minute string out which was a little bit easier but the whole way through i am thinking about the edit as i am filming the athletes within that specific league so and i actually when i was pitching on this campaign i thought you know this is a bit of an unusual unconventional spot and process because it's almost like post is first editorial Mm -hmm. is first. So I actually called my edit team at cabin and I said, 
let's make a spec ad. Let's show them what it could look like. Hold on. Let me put cabin editorial on my list. <laughs> <laughs> <In your> notes app. <laughs> They're, an editing company is that them yeah they're awesome they're great great partners cool. they're first on um, my list <laughs> and um so i did a spec ad for the campaign which i, I think played a big part in, in me winning the job with radical when my, you did the spec ad in your t- pitch yes in my treatment so you were and you was it a triple bin were you up against two other directors i was yes okay so yeah. So they didn't make spec ads. I mean, we, we talk about the arms race <laughs> of, you know, like Oren's big into, um, he'll shoot a custom video and like a little mm-hmm. pitch and do a VFX or whatever, and, you know, everything's yeah. animated gifts now and stuff, but like a spec ad in the treatment phase, that's, those are big guns. That's, that's hard to beat, Nina. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I was up against some really named directors yeah. and I was yeah. like, also all being the only woman as I often am, it's like, Oh gosh, how do I really stick out? And so it's Can just ask you a, a very uh, side question real quick. When you're up against whatever, like huge, you know, Errol Morris and David Gordon green or whoever you're up against, like, are you like watching their stuff? Or are you trying to like tune their work out as much as possible so that you, you're not thinking about it like when you're pitching. Yeah, I, I used to get really obsessive about it. And I actually asked my production company, my reps, like, please don't tell me who I'm pitching against anymore mm-hmm. because I just mm-hmm. get really um, insecure about it oftentimes. But I don't ever look at their work or read their articles. I try really to, to stay in my lane and yeah. um, just, just focus on me. So... I think the spec ad was great. My first call with ad council, they were like, if you can deliver this, we'll be super happy. And I, I promised them it will succeed the spec ad. I promise. Mm-hmm. Um, and your, was your spec ad a 90 second at like spot, like the final product? Yeah, it was either a 60 or a 90. And it was a lot of ripped footage from YouTube with the leagues, some of my own personal work infused in there. And then some ads that I just really love and have respected for years. So you didn't have like the actual athletes that you were going to go film in your spec? Um, No, because at the time we were pitching, we didn't know which athletes would be selected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what did you know? You knew it's like this giant campaign. It's about mental health. Yes. Like, did you just make up your own script? Like, did you basically like write the ad or did they give you? No, they had, they had the ad, they had the script written already. And we knew that the core of the ad was around rituals and how athletes Mm. rituals can make them better both on and off the court and rituals can help in your um, mental health journey. So I knew, okay, some, I knew some athletes and what their rituals were. I knew which athletes were very public about mental health, um, Mm -hmm. like Simone Biles Mm -hmm. or Naomi Osaka. So I put Mm -hmm. some athletes like that in, in my spec video. And, um, then after awarded the job, then a lot of the athletes signed up, the league signed up and we would, just get information kind of piecemeal. And, um, it all happened really, really fast. Uh, uh, you know, I was asked on a Monday if I could go to Pittsburgh on a Wednesday or Houston that Saturday. So it was very much, um, like fly by the seat of your pants and, uh, doc style in a way, because no matter how much you plan with your, post team or in prep with your team, with your DPs, with your producers, we would show up to these cities and meet these athletes and sometimes get 20 minutes with them, sometimes get an hour with them, Mm -hmm. not have time for a scout. So you're Mm -hmm. really just improvising very quickly. In having done the spec version that must have inadvertently prepared you to be able to be looser right because you 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 literally did it all already and now you're just going back and you know improving improving upon and obviously things have changed a lot but like you're you've already locked in the vibe you're looking for and the editing style and all of those things what were the things that evolved between that spec and the final piece outside of obviously 
talent and and all of that? Yeah, I would say a lot of like personalization. Once I found out who the athletes were, I did significant amount of research. For example, our NASCAR driver, Chase Elliott, um, his father was a very famous race car driver. And I really liked that. I wanted to give each athlete their own their own hook, their own Mm -hmm. characteristics. So his was very familial for me. Um, So we talked to him about, you know, the relationship and the meaning with his family. And did he have a memento or a photograph on him when he raced? And so I wanted to really try to customize them as much as possible um, and also connect them all. How does this campaign, how does a 90 with 11 sports leagues, Mm -hmm. 12 pro athletes, um, how can we make a unified spot? Mm -hmm. So that's where I wanted a lot of the rituals to play off of each other. We introduced split screens that uh, continued from one sports action to another and um, wanted to show that part of your like original pitch. Like it seems like something that you could maybe like put in a treatment, you know, like we'll start motion in one with one athlete and kind of finish it with another. No, that actually um, was during when I was going through all the archive, I thought, oh, my God, a lot of these plays are similar. A lot of the huddles are similar. Mm-hmm. Can a can a hockey puck somehow turn into a basketball sure. dunk? Sure. Um, and yeah. that was really a fun exploration. The agency was super open and loved it. And the editor and I just tried out a bunch of things until it worked. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah it's pretty great. So I'm curious, um, like when you, when you do have, you know, like a NASCAR driver, like how do you, how do you start making a shot list? And I don't know how familiar you were with NASCAR before you shot this. Like, is it something where you're studying the sport and you're trying to like do an ode, like you're finding, looking through footage and you're like, these are mm-hmm. awesome angles of NASCAR mm-hmm. footage, you know? And like, let's, let's start building our story from this or, or yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your process of like, how you shot list or do you just kind of find it on the day? Yeah, no, I definitely had a shot list. I had a template. Um, as I mentioned before, half these shoots I wasn't in person for, I was remote and then half the remote times Wi-Fi was down or whatever it may Mm be. Um, so I had a very specific shot list with mood boards and references that I would brief all the DPs and all the the film crews on, um, kind of like buckets, you know, I had my meditative Mm -hmm. moments, the ritual moments, could we get gameplay? And then I would prioritize them. If we had 20 minutes, what does that schedule look like? If we had an hour, what does that schedule look like? Um, and we already had all the great game footage in the can, you know? So for me, it was, okay, what does this athlete do behind the scenes that we can show people? What is, mm-hmm. how do they meditate? What is their ritual? Mm-hmm. What do they say to themselves? Um, what does mental health look like for each of these athletes? Um, so Did you get it, to pre-interview them or anything? No. How familiar were they then say when it's about when you have half an hour with them like how, how how prepared were they do you know what i mean like sometimes you show up and you're you you've heard that they had notes on the script and you know the team has approved every everything and then all of a sudden you're like oh you literally haven't read this before <laughs> you know like how how familiar yeah. with the concept were they because well, it, it's much more vulnerable than like again yeah. you know a silly joke or something like that Um, you know, all these athletes were donating their time. So they Mm -hmm. already were aware of the campaign and ad council's initiative. Most of them had seen the script. Um, Mm -hmm. and I always start with the script. I like to get that crossed off the list and then, you know, shoot the verite or the B roll or Mm -hmm. the portraits with them. And a lot of the times these athletes would be like, you want me laying on the floor? What? What? And I was like, trust me, trust me, trust me. And then I would show them kick a ball instead. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Some of them have never done a commercial before. Some of them have. So the level of comfort really varied. Um, So it all goes back to that trust. And I would Mm -hmm. sometimes show them playback or show them the monitor and they'd be like, oh, that looks awesome. And let's keep going and maximize our time. Um, So I would say all of them were very, you know, comfortable and familiar with 
what the intention was, why I was there with sometimes one DP, mm-hmm. sometimes eight, you know, a crew of eight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I've, I've just been watching it on repeat as we're talking. Um, and a thing that stands out to me that's really incredible is that, you know, we're talking about, oh, it's 90 seconds and there's all this footage, but like, you know, the, that NASCAR moment that we're describing is three shots, right? It's the, it's the, it's the photo that you'd referenced an insert of the photo of the, of the driver holding the photo and then him thinking about the photo. And then we're onto the next vignette. And, and I feel like that template or a version of that. And we, we, you re- revisit the characters a little bit later, but like, you know, it's still very, very economical and very emotional storytelling. So when you're building those shot lists out, you know, and because you've prevised everything so thoroughly, you know, you, you knew how important each and every beat was going to be right because essentially it's going to be just a single shot so even though you only got 20 minutes you still have to get that portrait you still have to get that meditation moment you still have to riff with them and warm them up all at once it's great sorry I'm, the, there's no question there it's no, just really yeah. awesome Thank you. i think that was um it was such a gratifying thing during this campaign but it was also very challenging how do you give each athlete the fair and appropriate amount of screen time. And within that screen time, you have a few seconds to tell a story. So a lot of the maybe more cinematic shots didn't make the cut because it had to have purpose. It had to have meaning and um, resonate with a big fan base. Is that like a big bummer when you're like, oh, this shot is so beautiful, but it's not making the cut? Or is that something that you don't like you know, I, I'm sure as a doc editor, you're, you're not editor, like as a doc filmmaker, you're used to losing a lot of amazing looking shots. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's definitely the toughest part of the job, I think, is the edit. You know, the shoot is so mm-hmm. great and you review the footage and you say, oh, I have an hour of incredible footage of this mm-hmm. basketball player. But then you get to the edit and you're like, oh, man. I have to pick four seconds total. What does that look like? Yeah. Yeah. How do you like approach the gear? Cause I mean, how many shoot days do you have on a, on a shoot like this? Like 25 or something? Um, we had one shoot day per league, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, you know, I, I was only present for five or six of them in person. Do you say like, okay, we're going to need a crane here. We're going to need a drone here. We're going to need a like, oh, handheld no. here. Everything was handheld. Oh, really? So, yeah. but there is a no, like an overhead shot of someone like on a football yeah, field, right? Yeah. Or like laying yeah. down, right? Yeah. 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 I'm okay. We had a steady cam for the day with the kids, but for the aerial shots, I go to the location. I look at the surroundings. Okay. There's a second story here. Can we do this without getting in trouble with the union? I look mm-hmm. at my DP and he's like thumbs up mm-hmm. already up there. And we get the you shot. You hold onto in. his belt as he's <laughs> leaning over the, the edge. <laughs> <laughs> Safety is number one sure, always. Sure. Um, it was very safe, but uh, I really wanted to get the scale of that stadium because it was really beautiful. It's kind of fascinating. It's all handheld because like I watch like I, something I've been thinking a lot about and I'm working on a job right now where it's kind of like a montage and I'm trying to build scope in Mm -hmm. one location, but I'm trying to make it feel Mm -hmm. like we've seen every type of shot, you know, like, and so to me, like going from an insert shot to an epic wide shot to like um, a funny pan to an overhead shot, like that's what can give a campaign scope. And like watching your, I mean, it's 90 seconds. You have a lot of shots, but like, you do have that. You have someone, an insert on a photograph and then like an entire football stadium. And then you have also another entire stadium, but this one's empty and it's just one person there. And then an overhead shot. And then, yeah, steady cam shots. And obviously you're using a lot of existing footage also like walking behind athletes as they're on the court or as they're winning, you know, or the games are ending. Um, like, is that something that you think about consciously or just kind of happens like getting yeah. like a variety of types of shots for that. It was like, okay, how do we depict, um, 
what mental health looks like, what meditation looks like. So for me, it was like when an athlete is really in their own head space and having these private moments, I always wanted to ha- have this juxtaposition of cameras really close on, on level with them on ground with them. And then, okay, let them breathe. Let's let this exhale all the way out. Um, how wide can we get in this moment? I'm, I always tell my DPs, like, I don't like getting coverage for coverage. I don't like a mid shot. I'm all like, let's go all the way in or all the way back. Um, and it, it just felt very fitting for this campaign. That's awesome. Do you play with like depth of field? Is that like a tool of yours? Recently, I've kind of like been like to really shoot to shoot deep stuff, like not a lot of shallow fo- focus stuff, you know, mm-hmm. like when you're making your shot list and you know what the location is, is that something that like comes into play when you're deciding like how to shoot something? Um, a little bit. Yeah. I think for me, this, this whole, um, when, when we were able to shoot with the athletes was very much, um, what is a snapshot? What does the portrait look like? Mm -hmm. Um, I have a photography background, so I'm always thinking in terms of photographs, like what would a medium format snapshot look like in this moment? And then Mm -hmm. how do we achieve that? Um, and and what does portrait mean to you? Is it a shot of the face or is it like a shot of someone doing the thing that they do? That's really up to, to you to interpret. My interpretation is something that is a little specific and um, a, a way into the eyes of the subject, a little bit of let's see the soul of this shot. Um, but it can be speaking of eyes, the eyes are taking up a very small portion of the frame and then the rest is their environment. So I like to get of course, a little bit artsy with, with what we do, but, um, I wanted it to be like a very composed and controlled moment because the second these athletes step onto the playing field, it's, it can be chaos. And so I really Mm -hmm. wanted to show that contrast. Well, I know we're, we're kind of coming up on time and I wanted to talk about one other thing that I saw on your website, which is, you know, you have, uh, if you click on home, what do we see? We see uh, some big images and then click on films. You see your, your kind of some of your recent work, which I'm assuming it's probably like all of our websites where we're like six to eight months behind updating it. But you have a a button here called mentorship and I clicked Mm -hmm. on it and it says Nina is committing, committed to mentoring new directors, providing them with guidance, shadow and production experience, submit the form below and include your website, portfolio, memes, whatever. What happens? What, What kind of people put stuff in here? A lot of amazing people and I wish that, and maybe there is that I don't know about. Um, I called the DGA. I was like, what do you have for all these aspiring filmmakers? And there's nothing very formal or official, but for me, it's very important to take on mentees in all of my productions or as many as I can. And it's a paid role as well. Um, I never had a real mentor in the industry. I always really wanted one. I was often told, especially as a woman, no, you can't be a director. No, you can't be a DP. And I was like, why, why, why not? Um, so I worked really, really, really hard to get to where I am. I'm very proud of that, but I also know I have to open doors for others. Um, a, a woman who has been my mentee for two years is shooting her first feature right now with some incredible A-list actors. And I'm like, wow, she's like years beyond what I could do right now. And so it just, it's so gratifying and I love doing it. I, I do give a little priority to women, non-binary BIPOC, but a lot of white male cis people apply. And I, I try really hard to, at, at the very least, take calls with everyone. Um, I've gotten a lot of applications and there's only one of me. So I, I really encourage and ask other fellow directors to do the same because it's such an invaluable part of the process. And it's not just, I, I say to all of them, it's not just come to set and let's play. It's what are you, what are you interested? Are you interested in the 
the pitching process, the post process, the cinematography process. And then I try to cater it to each mentee and really um, make it valuable for them. Let's say you choose someone to be a mentee. How, how do you allocate time to them? like what? So you have a call with them and mm-hmm. you figure out what they want to get out of this. Mm-hmm. And if they're like, I just want to be a director like you, mm-hmm. then that you try to get more specific. Right. Yeah. I mean, the the ideal would be if you had a job coming up, if you had a pitch coming up, whether you get it or don't get it, that you bring this person on, let them silently listen to your Zoom calls, BCC them on all mm-hmm. your emails with your treatment designers and writers, et cetera. Um, and I have radical media behind me supporting this. We're trying to make it official in the, in the coming year and make it a little bit more interactive where it can be like a round table of directors Mm -hmm. and um, aspiring directors. So, you know, there's no rule book or, or guidebook. It's whatever suits you and however much time you have, you know, I have a newborn, I have a one year old daughter. I am constantly trying to work and pitch and, do pottery when I can, but it's really crucial to make time for, for people too. Um, you know, it's kismet and I, I like to give back. Yeah, no, I would, I, it's funny because I like, am simultaneously very, would be very excited by something like that. A mentor ship type thing. I mean, we have a podcast, you know, or hopefully, sure, yeah. <laughs> hopefully yeah, some people yeah. are getting something out of it, but, um, that way, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm also like always so stressed. I have two kids and, um, you know, just things. My mom's like always trying to hang out with me, my family. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, I'm always like pitching and editing and doing things and trying to level up or whatever. It's hard to, you know, find that kind of calm moment where I can, mm-hmm. I mean, I like talking to people. Like if somebody just calls me and asks me for advice, I usually will talk to them, but you know, making something formal about it where you're like, Hey, I'm going to allocate time to this person seems intimidating. Yeah. yeah. But it can be an informal too. You know, it could be, let's just take a few calls when, when I have 10 minutes and ask me anything. Um, yeah. I'm sure you, you guys do that in, in an incredible way with this podcast and you're, growing base of listeners so you are doing it you are giving back yeah 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 thank you it's mainly just so that we can be like anytime anyone asks us a question we're like uh there's 492 episodes <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> the answer is in there somewhere yeah. um uh, what I like about your strategy is it sounds like, yes, it's very active in so much as like you're fielding those emails and you're, you're having conversations with the people, but then also there, once you get past a few of those initial conversations or hurdles, looping them into a job, BCCing them, you know, that's incredibly valuable. Like that, the, that's a level of exposure and insight that is so, so rare, but also it's not a ton more work for you. Do you know what I mean? Like you just add them to the email and all of a sudden their mind is blown for like literally a few keystrokes. And I think that's really brilliant. So like, like engineering ways to help people in that are high impact for them and low impact for you is really brilliant. It's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. And I think one other thing is like, I say to all of them, whether you like what I do or really don't like what I do process wise, you're learning something. Yeah. Just tell me you like it, whether you like it. Or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Keep it to yourself, but also you don't have to do it. I want to go back to something that I'm, I'm curious about. You said that they're all paid positions. Mm-hmm. So am I misunderstanding that? Are you saying that like, if some, if you are mentoring some, someone they're paid to be there, is that right? Is, is that what I'm understanding? Yeah, that's, or? That's why I mentioned if there's a job, it is ideal because then you can pay them a PA rate or whatever Mm -hmm. the agency Mm -hmm. or production company will pay them to be with you. So at the start of a job, I'll ask my producer, can we allocate five or 10 days to this role? Mm -hmm. And almost all the time they're like, yeah, that's awesome. And I'll introduce them to the agency creatives, to the producers, bring them to fittings Pre pros, et cetera, et cetera. And how many, and they only have to pick up your dry cleaning like once or twice. They so. Yeah. They just have to get me an iced latte and we're good. No, no. Um, yeah. 
I am with really... soy milk. How many times <laughs> do you have to say it? Um, <laughs> hazelnut. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I like kind of what you're saying also about like, oh, maybe they're when they want to learn about the pitch process or they want to learn about mm-hmm. how to work with agencies or cinematography. Because I do feel like we get a lot of people approaching us that are really kind of green and are like, I just want to work in the industry. Tell me right. what to do. And you're right. like, I, I don't know what to tell you. Kid. Well, yeah, half the time they don't just know. Just give me what that it, hazelnut latte. Yeah. <laughs> they don't know what a pitch is. They don't know what a triple sure. bit is. So sure. let's let's educate and inform a little bit and they'll either love it or they'll hate it. Awesome. Well, do you have a couple more minutes just to endorse something with us? Yes. Unpaid endorsements. <laughs> So my unpaid endorsement is kind of a good one. It's been a minute. I feel like we all have kids. It's a little hard to absorb culture. You're just kind of like working all the time. You're like, I don't know, man. I can't recommend reruns of Survivor. So I got a good one finally. Uh, Richard Linkletter has a a new movie out and he has a really great interview on The Daily. It's really awesome. And like, It's it's, it's actually called The Interview. It's not The Daily. But it's in The Daily Feed. Yeah, they're like the daily is promoting the interview. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, oh, pardon me. Okay. Well, but yeah, uh, I stand corrected. Did you, have you listened to Orand? Yeah, that's good. It's great. It's really good. Yeah. It's special to have a filmmaker who's been working mostly in the ind- independent space, but he, get to, he gets to do both. He can do a studio film when he wants to and something a little smaller when it, it calls for it. And, he, he, you know, the clutter is such a thoughtful filmmaker. And so just to hear him talk about his process, the new film, but also like, you know, they go through the greatest hits. We're talking about the before series a little bit and boyhood and all of that stuff, the, the nature of identity and time. And he's, you know, he's aging as well in a way that's like totally approachable and really insightful and a tiny bit pretentious, which is the perfect recipe for a Richard Linkletter film. It's my favorite. I love it. Yeah. So I, I found um, him to be not that pretentious. Um, sure. Until that. You, th- you think about it and you're like, oh man, this is like a little like stoner dorm room philosophy as well. Have you yeah. seen Living Life, Warren? Yeah. 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 You know, I, I mean, I, yeah, no, I, I like my and, favorite part. And no slack, like, of, like truly yeah. a hero of mine, you know, like. Did you hear it, Nina? No, but um, one of the actors I worked with is in his new movie. So I, I will definitely check it out. Oh, awesome. Oh, cool. Glenn Powell? The female co-star. Oh. Audrey Arjuna. Oh, oh, cool. Cool. Yeah, she's yeah. awesome. Um, I, uh, my favorite part of the interview is when he talks about he's 63 now and he talks about his passion for filmmaking now versus when he was like 20, you know, Mm -hmm. and how it evolves, you know, when you're 20, you're like, he may, he makes this comparison where he's like, if I had like my roll of 35 millimeter film and it like fell in a lake and my best friend was in the lake too, drowning, like who would I save when I was 20, I would have probably gone for the reel of film. Um, you know, cause it was just like my, everything It was like my whole life revolved around this and now just a much more balanced life. You know, I have a family, but it doesn't mean I'm like less passionate. It's just, you know, just a di- different relationship with yeah. your love of film and passion and stuff. Anyway, I, I, yeah, highly recommended. Finally, Matt, a good endorsement. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Um, Nina, how about you? That was such like a beautiful and poignant and filmmaker response that I'm just going to go 180. Great. Perfect. Um, my daughter has had some like GI stomach issues lately. Mm, sure. And so my unpaid endorsement is for ripple pea milk, which has really saved her gut. It is P E A not P E E based <laughs> milk. <laughs> Um, it's similar to almond milk and it's fantastic. So, um, does it taste good? Yeah, it's fine. It's, I mean, I don't, my favorite like non-dairy milk is oat, but it's definitely a little more similar to almond. And, um, I mean, almond we can agree is like the worst to the yeah, milk from a flavor. Sure. It tastes like water. Oh, oh I know. I, I like almond. I like all the fake milks. Yeah. It's I mean, and oat yeah. milk, you know, it's like drinking a cookie, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I do enjoy it though. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's been life changing for, for us in this household. So, um, ripple, ripple milk, ripple milk. Thank you for helping us out. Ripple pea milk. 
Yeah. Just drink some pee. Feel better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. Kathleen, what you got? It's a preliminary endorsement, but I don't, mm-hmm. I, I'm going to follow up at some point within a few episodes and let you know, but I just bought this like Breville air fryer toaster oven combo mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. And it was not, not cheap. And, uh, Today was the first time I tried to air fry some things. I air fried some frozen sweet potato French fries. And Mm -hmm. of course, I tried to like take some shortcuts. So I tried to do that and like some broccoli and cauliflower at the same time all in the same basket. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was the first mistake I made. Um, (laughs) And these, if you guys have ever gotten the frozen sweet potato French fries at Trader Joe's, they're awful. There's like no way to make them taste good. Uh, But the air fryer is the closest they've come to like palatable. Mm -hmm. Um, If if you get the non sweet potato ones, the regular French fries are good, but the sweet potato ones, they're just awful. And, you know, my wife keeps insisting that they're better in some way. So, um, so I I think this air frying thing, I'm I'm getting into it. I know it's very trendy. Everyone I know is air frying stuff. So if you have an air fry, like a simple air fry recipe for something that's not like chicken wings, something that's Mm -hmm. like, slightly healthy not that french fries are healthy you know feel free to to dm me on instagram at ocaplin i want to get into this air frying thing because it seems like seems like a shortcut to making dinner for kids fast but i I just haven't quite figured it out yet so i'm looking is it the breville smart oven air fryer pro is it the wire cutter recommendation uh so it's not the pro it's the exact same as the pro Except it's the pro is very deep. It's like 21 inches deep. So you, you have, mm-hmm. if you keep it on your counter, you have like three inches left of counter. Yeah. yeah, yeah so we got the non pro one. It does. The only difference is it's smaller and it doesn't dehydrate, which mm. to be honest, I was very excited to like make some fruit roll ups for my kids. Sure. <laughs> sure. But I think uh, you're spending like $38 on mangoes and then you get like <laughs> four square inches of yeah, fruit yeah. roll up. So well, I don't know that it's so economical. You, you made me realize uh, that. I used to have the wire cutter recommendation for the uh, convection toaster oven. Um, and now I have the runner up. You have the, the updated nicer version. Yeah, You have the Cuisinart. I have the Cuisinart, which is nice. But ultimately, I, I, I hope that you get the hang of it. I feel like people talk about how much they love their air fryers and they're like, Oh my God, it's so easy or whatever. And it's always the basket kind where they just like pop it in or whatever. Yeah. And this this is, this is a toaster oven. It's not the basket time. It's it's just a straight up toaster oven with a convection oven option, which is literally the air frying is just a rebranded term for convection oven. Right. And it does come with like a basket that you can like put French fries. Oh, interesting. So you have to clean that out. You have to clean that out guys. My sister started a grease fire and Oh, good to know. Yeah. It was pretty, uh, terrible. Uh, yeah. The (laughs) ambulance came and everything. So just a, a PSA to clean that, that part out. Yeah, mental health and clean your yeah. air fryer basket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're looking out for us left and right. <laughs> awesome. Anyway, yeah. this has been a toaster oven talk. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll update you it, for a real endorsement. And this is like such a cheap one, almost as cheap as Matt's. But like the Conan O'Brien, Ron Howard episode, Conan O'Brien needs a friend with Ron Howard is, is pretty good um, in a in a similar similar way to Matt's endorsement. Well, this was incredible. Nina, where can people keep tabs on all of the cool projects that you've got going on? Maybe I have to get a little bit better at Instagram, but at Nina Meredith or Nina Meredith.com. And uh, if you want to apply to shadow or just chat, drop me a, drop me a line. Thanks for having me guys. This was so fun. Well, if you have any questions for us, you can shoot us an email at justshootitpod at gmail.com or at justshootitpod across basically all social media. And you can follow me at Mr. Ben and Lowe across all social media as well. And I'm at O. Kaplan on Instagram. This episode is edited by Noah Bayshore, also with some producing from him and additional producing from Tyler Small. And you're listening to music from the Free Music Archive and the artist Jazar. And we will catch you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.